So um, as we heard earlier, you know, pollinators are declining and, and you've probably heard a lot of the sort of insect apocalypse headlines and all of that. So there's a lot of research out there that are showing that's showing that we have a clear issue with insect decline. Um, and this figure is part of a paper that I was part of about uh, a roadmap for how we can actually implement solutions to conserve insects. And so um, you can kind of see some of them, hopefully you guys can read some of those, but a lot of it, you know, it, it relates to large scale actions on an international or national level, as well as smaller scales, you know, replacing lawns with insect friendly habitat, for example, which we heard a lot about or, or what Eric was just talking about with, with soil and that could be on a small scale from his, you know, garden plot to a large scale of an agricultural field. So um, Jess, if you can click the next one, I got a couple of animations on the slide. So here I circled um, where the ESA kind of intersects. So one of the prongs of the solutions is to conserve rare species. And so that's what the Endangered Species Act does. In addition, there's kind of this prioritization idea where we've got this, um, uh, you know, this idea of collecting information. So there, the other problem we have with insects in the ESA is that, you know, we just don't have a lot of information. And you'll hear me say this a lot, and you probably will hear a lot of people say this um, over the next few days. Um, but basically, uh, the petition process also helps us gather information and prioritize species for conservation. Okay, so you can go to the next one. So this is the other part of the, the figure. And so we've got some sort of midterm actions on one hand and then some sort of other longer term actions. And then the first one there talks more about partnerships. And so that is where, you know, you got you, um, the audience is land managers. If you are a land manager, even if you own your own, you know, your own property, um, you know, you can really intersect in the solutions for insects and implement a lot of the, the solutions that we'll be talking about over the next few days. Okay, so next slide. So at the center, um, our approach, you know, is to, to um, conserve species. You know, we're a mission center, dr mission driven organization. Um, we've conserved, you know, hundreds of endangered species and millions of critical habitat. Um, and, and we use the same approach to insect conservation and pollinator conservation in particular. And so we particularly use the Endangered Species Act. Okay, next one. So um, to give you a brief overview, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the Endangered Species Act, but the Endangered Species Act um, was implemented in 1973 and it's the world's, uh, we'd like to think at least the strongest law for protecting species threatened with extinction. Um, it was really important at the time because it acknowledged that economic growth and development without adequate conservation measures is going to basically destroy biodiversity. Um, and so that was sort of the recognition of it. And the Supreme Court has since found the intent of Congress in enacting the Endangered Species Act is to halt and reverse the trend towards species extinction whatever the cost. So it really, really spotlights species conservation above all else, which is, you know, really important rule, which really has not been seen or rivaled um, in the world. Uh, it's implemented by the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, as well as the National Marine Fishery Service for uh, marine species. So under the Endangered Species Act, the protections require uh, the establishment of critical habitat. So as you know, we all know that species cannot survive without their habitat. And so the act actually is supposed to not only list the species, but also establish critical habitat for that species. In addition, another important component of the Endangered Species Act is our recovery plans. So in recovery plans, uh, the, the Fish and Wildlife Service outlined the goals, the tasks required, also the cost and the estimated timeline to recover endangered species. Currently, the Act, the Act protects more than 1,600 species in the United States and its territories. However, several hundred species are still waiting for a listing decision. So they're still waiting to be determined whether they will be listed um, as endangered or threatened. Um, and the most recent sort of spotlight example of that is the monarch butterfly, which we can mention again later. 
All right. So um, a fundamental purpose of the act is um, to prevent extinction and also to recover species so, they're, so they are no longer threatened or endangered. And part of that is kind of the regulatory teeth of the act, which is the section nine. And what section nine does is to prevent take. So take is a really interesting word <laughs> under the Endangered Species Act because it has specific meaning. So here I wrote it out for you. In this case, take means to harass, harm, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, kill, trap, capture, or collect, or attempt to engage in any such contact um, conduct. So you are under technically a bylaw under the Endangered Species Act. Humans are not allowed to do any of these things to an endangered species. All right, you can click again. I think there's a little more. And under that, the strongest word and the one that has been most contested, if you will, in the courts is harm. And harm has been specifically defined as significant habitat modification or degradation, or actually kills or injures wildlife by significantly impairing essential behavior patterns, including breeding, feeding, and sheltering. So you can see here that harm really is an important component of take because it also adds those requirements of species, habitat, um, you know, what it needs to breed and to feed and to have normal behaviors. All right, so next one. And then if, um, if an agency, and I'll talk about this in the next slide as well, or, you know, a personal um, person, you know, so if you would want, if you have an endangered species on your property, for instance, and you want to improve that property, then, or change that property, maybe build something, and you do have an endangered species, you will likely need to obtain an, an ITP, which is an incidental take permit. And in that case, you actually have to get permission from Fish and Wildlife Service to do those activities. And a lot of times they will permit you to take a certain amount of habitat under what's called a HCP or a habitat conservation plan. So that is also an important component of the act. All right, next one. So in, the, in section seven of the ESA, it's, it kind of relates, okay, how can take happen, but from a federal agency point of view? So let's say the U.S. Forest Service or the endangered, or sorry, the um, EPA wants to release a pesticide or the U.S. Forest Service wants to allow grazing in certain areas. Um, for instance, they have to then do what's called consultation. So that is um, regulated under section seven of the ESA. So if you just kind of look at the flow chart on the right hand side a little bit, basically um, the purpose of the consultation is to determine whether a listed species or critical habitat is in the action area. So if that species or its habitat is in the area where the Forest Service wants to graze, for instance, or, or cut down um, timber, for instance. And so then the, if that's the case, then the point then is to determine the effects of that action on the species and explore ways to modify it, um, whether by reducing the impact or actually in some cases, potentially even benefiting the species through mitigation, like buying um, or purchasing or um, owning or modifying, improving land nearby that is also important habitat. Um, so if you look kind of on the bottom right hand side of the flow chart, if the agency, in this case like the Forest Service, determines that a project may affect, there's always like funny words, right, may affect but not likely to adversely affect a listed species or its critical habitat, what they do basically is ask Fish and Wildlife Service to concur with them. You know, they say, we don't think that this is going to adversely affect the species, do you agree? And if the service agrees, it's kind of finished. And a lot of times they still have to do mitigation measures. However, on the left side, if they do find that the project will adversely affect the species, they then need to enter into formal consultation. So formal consultation is um, kind of like all, all that text I have on the left-hand side. The point of that is to determine if the action will jeopardize the species. So jeopardize means basically that it's going to impact the continued existence of the listed species or destroy or adversely, modif adversely modify its critical habitat. So in this case, you might be thinking, oh, well, if it's going to jeopardize the endangered species, right, then it probably shouldn't 
happen. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not often the case. Um, and usually, actually, it's, um, I don't think it ever has been the case, maybe a few times, but most of the time it's not. And the instead, the outcome is that there will be, again, mitigation measures, maybe a little bit more steep mitigation measures that we have to enter into some kind of contract to enhance the habitat over time. Um, and or they may also be given actual numbers of species that they can take. So, you know, service might say, well, you could take X percent of this population. Um, if you click one more time, just there is a, um, a statistic here. So there was um, a study in 2015 that looked at how many times the Section 7 um, found jeopardy in, in, in all of the, these 88,000 projects they found um, only 7% actually found a jeopardy determination and none of them were actually stopped or extensively altered. So while the section seven is an important component to get some mitigation for species, it often doesn't result in um, preventing projects. Okay, continue. So despite this, um, the ESA is still extremely effective and because mostly it often um, contributes to critical habitat, it contributes to recovery. Um, you know, people have, uh, scholars have found that it has prevented um, of the species listed over 99% of them from going extinct. And also they've looked into without the ESA's protection, almost nearly 300 species would have gone extinct. So it's, um, it's been very successful. All right, next slide. So uh, studies have found that um, species have improved with a few things. One of them, of course, is time since listing. That's that's the biggest thing. So if a species was listed in the past, it's in um, the far past, it's probably doing better than one that was listed a couple of years ago. Um, in addition, recovery is associated with um, implementation of recovery plans. So about 71% of species listed actually have recovery plans. Um, you know, it would be better if it was 100, um, but that's a pretty good number. So a lot of them have recovery plans. And if they do have those plans, they tend to be more successful. So um, the also in addition that has helped recovery is the progress towards completing recovery goals. Um, designation of critical habitat is, is very, very um, important. Um, unfortunately, recovery funds have been chronically underfunded. Uh, we always are trying to get, I, a letter just came out this morning, one of my colleagues in DC is trying to get um, the service more money for species recovery from Congress. Unfortunately, I think uh, under, even under the Obama administration, it was only about 3% of what was estimated need um, in addition, the funds are indirectly are uh, in, disproportionately spent. So about 2% of species get nearly 60% of the money. Um, a third get less than $10,000 a year and 13% get less than 500. So you can imagine, you know, insects and pollinators are competing with wolves and other large mammals. And so uh, a lot of times, unfortunately, um, the recovery funds don't get towards the insects. So hopefully we can we can help change that. Just get more money overall. Okay, next slide. Let me check the time. All right. Oh, there we go. Um, on the left here, this is a, a flow chart about how petitions work. So basically, how do we get a species protected? How do we do a petition? Um, and the Fish and Wildlife Service have this flowchart on their website if you are interested in looking at it. But basically what it is is that it takes quite a while. It is kind of the bottom line and the take home story of this, of this flowchart. So let's say we submit a petition um, under the Endangered Species Act, the Fish and Wildlife Service is supposed to respond to us in 90 days and say whether that we have, if we have enough substantial information in our petition for it to be really reviewed. Um, and then uh, there's supposed to be a, a year, a 12 month finding, which then the, species, the Fish and Wildlife Service would propose to list the species or say that they, have, they did not find that actually warrants listing. Um, that period, period of time takes quite a while. To give you an example, um, the, the listing decision on the Monarch came out in December uh, 2020 and the petition was filed in 2014. And that one actually is, is not even that bad. I think the average is about 12 years. So it, it is a process to get things listed. Um, specifically, what do petitions require? Um, so they require a lot of detailed information. 
Um, so Jess, can you do the next? Thank you. So petitions um, need historic and current range information. So we need a lot of data. And you can imagine for insects, getting historic and current range information is not easy. Um, so, you know, you can help with this. If, if any of you are interested in, um, you know, iNaturalist or community science, it's extremely helpful. You know, writing petitions, we actually do use, use those, that information. So um, if you do use iNaturalist, you know, please, uh, input that when you see pollinators uh, when you're working um, or any insect really. Um, great. So if you, uh, let's see, yes, yeah, so another component of, of listing are threats. So not only do we need um, past and current information on their range, we also need to know what they're threatened by. And under the Endangered Species Act, they, we need to kind of prove that they're threatened by five different factors. Um, habitat loss, which usually is not that big of a problem, um, disease and predate, predation, overutilization, um, other factors like climate change or invasive species, um, and then, of course, inadequacy of regulatory mechanisms. So proving basically that they're not already protected um, at the state level or something like that. All right. Um, let's see, you can go to the next slide. I think we're like 10 minutes behind, so I'm not exactly sure where my timing's at at this point, but I'm gonna go through a couple of examples of uh, some petitions that we did for solitary bees and basically show you how it can be very difficult in terms of the data. So this is the Mojave poppy bee on the right hand side here and it's Las Vegas bear poppy. And it is mainly threatened by urbanization, gypsum mining, uh, recreation like off-road vehicles as well as grazing. Uh, it's a specialist on the bear poppies in the Mojave desert. It, currently is only known from seven locations in Clark County, almost all of them in the um, uh, National Recreation Area. And it has likely been, likely now gone from the rest of Las Vegas. So um, we know this from surveys. So surveys have actually been done in kind of the Clark County area. And we're pretty sure that they are no longer found there. We're also pretty sure that they're likely to be extinct from Utah. And they appear to be gone from California. You can kind of see in that bottom left hand corner, there are some historical dots of the bee. So this is kind of a, um, you know, a situation where we looked at uh, several bees and said, you know, this one definitely has a clear, clear threats. Um, it's declining. And so it's one of the best, you know, native bees that we have evidence for of decline. And, um, Currently, because of the petition and the positive 90-day finding by the Fish and Wildlife Service, there are surveys being done, and it has not been found in Utah, unfortunately. So likely, the data that we do have are correct. All right, next one. So another example of a solitary bee that's a specialist is the um, Gulf Coast solitary bee. It's a specialist on the coastal plain honeycomb head. It's only found in uh, kind of Gulf Coast barrier islands off the coast of, uh, well, it was in the past, Florida, Mississippi, and Alabama. It's only found about within 500 meters of the shoreline. So climate change and sea level rise, increased storms, a huge threat to this bee. Um, there was a recent comprehensive survey in Florida of the bee by um, a master's student. So oftentimes, you know, master's and PhD theses are also extremely important um, and useful pieces of information um, on bee ranges. Um, is it, got, it, it seems to be a gone from Mississippi and the historic Florida sites. Um, sorry, Alabama. Mississippi is a little bit more of a um, unknown. So we're hoping that, you know, with the petition that also received a positive 90-day finding for Fish and Wildlife Service, that we will get more surveys um, in this bee. And, you know, that would be great if it seemed to be much more common than we assume, but likely that is not the case. Um, and hopefully it will be protected. All right. And so Jess is now going to talk to you guys about some um, bumblebee and butterfly examples. Yeah, thanks, Tara. You know, my name is Jess Tyler. I'm a, also a staff scientist at the center. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Tara on these last two uh, bee petitions. Um, but our most recent bee petition effort has been for the American bumblebee, which we um, submitted to the Fish and Wildlife Service earlier 
in February. Um, this is a collaboration with another a, a student, a law student group, uh, the Bombas Pollinator Association of Law Students, the Beep House. Um, we uh, submitted this petition um, based on uh, evidence that um, have, was published in the IUCN reports for bumblebees um, that uh, the Xerxes Society, many people from the Xerxes Society have worked on. Uh, and the American bumblebee was listed as vulnerable under the IUCN reports as, that were published a few years ago. Um, so we, we've known this bee has been declining for a while. Um, this bee is um, was very uh, striking to us because it was it's one of the most widespread species in the lower 48 states, found in 47 of the lower 48. Um, it was one of the most common bumblebees. Um, in a, um, we we decided to move forward with this petition because um, it was striking to us that if such a common bumblebee could be declining, then there must be really some serious problems that are widespread across the country um, that affect bumblebees. And, and the species could potentially serve as an umbrella species to protect others. Um, uh, I, I'm just gonna go into some, inform some information about its decline. It's uh, um, down almost 90% relative abundance over a relatively short amount of time, about the last 20 years. And it's now disappeared from eight states in the Northeast and the upper Midwest. As you can see from this map, um, the green dots are uh, historic observations and the black ones are recent observations. I, I colored the, the states to show rel um, relative decline, red be being greater, greater amounts of decline. Um, you can see in the Northeast and the upper Midwest, um, really significant declines. This is, again, one of the most common species um, representing about 45% of all bumblebees uh, east of the Rockies, but it has declined to about only about 10% currently. So the ESA is not just for rare species, it can also help us um, save once common species like the, like the rusty patch bumblebee was also a once common species in Minnesota and the Midwest. Um, and much like the rusty patched, the American bumblebee has declined, has seen a similar degree of decline across the Midwest and Northeast. Um, yeah, declines in the 80 to 90% category. The American bumblebee down 50% overall, um, according to the IUCN. Um, so that, yeah, the threats facing the American bumblebee and the pace for it really rely on some really important research that's come out in the last few years. Um, the threats that, that bumblebees are facing um, are the, the usual suspects that affect all pollinators, habitat loss, pesticide use, disease, climate change, small populations, etc. cetera. Um, what's important for this bee, um, we believe we wrote in the petition is that it's this combination of threats that have really brought down this once common bee. Um, the research has shown um, correlations between herbicide use and decline uh, herbicide obviously reducing floral resources among ag on agricultural areas. Uh, fungicide use, interestingly, is also associated with the decline of this species. Uh, fungicide, fungicides are known to uh, harm uh, bumblebee immune systems and make them more susceptible to disease. Uh, one of the most important papers that have come out recently has shown that um, of the spe of the bumblebees that are declining in the United States, those that are declining, like the American bumblebee, the Western bumblebee, rusty patched, um, all have greater rates of infection of Nusema and, and other bumblebee diseases. Um, so the um, the factors that reduce bumblebee health, um, uh, you know, increase the rates that they're they're getting they're getting sick from. Uh, pathogen spillover, especially from uh, domesticated honeybees and bumblebees. This map shows an interesting correlation that we found between the, the um, number of greenhouse operations and bumblebee decline. You can see in the upper Midwest, there's a great increase in uh, greenhouse crops. And uh, greenhouse crops that require pollinators are often 
pollinated by domesticated bumblebees, which can spill over diseases into wild populations. So we petitioned for the American bumblebee because we believe that the ESA is the most effective tool to preserve uh, and conserve this species. Uh, we need a, a tool that matches the scale of the problem. This bee is so wide ranging that any one, any one state uh, action would not would be insufficient to uh, to protect. And so, yeah, like, like Tara outlined, the ESA uh, provides many different benefits for species, starting with uh, establishing legal grounds for protection, um, which engages the federal government under Section Seven to consult um, on on any new uh, project or, or activity. Um, the ESA also protects uh, critical habitat, so it sets aside habitat for the bee that is that can be managed and uh, with the threats reduced. ESA protection uh, gets a bee funding and encourages research to determine the severity and causes of the, 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 the decline. Uh, this, this engagement in research engages local stakeholders and other uh, land managers at the state and, lo and local state and national level to um, importantly develop, uses research to develop best management practices to figure out how to, how to save the species. And that's one thing that we, that, I, that will be steps going forward is to how, how do we, we need to know what is the best way to help this bee and ultimately slow and stop its uh, extirpation from parts of its historic range. So that's our recent work on the American bumblebee. I wanted to also highlight some information about other ESA protected butterflies, um, pollinators under the act. Um, uh, Tara and I as, and some others at the center have been working on a review of the, of the status of all ESA protected butterflies, at least in the lower 48 states. Um, and we will present some of our pre preliminary findings here. We hope to uh, publish uh, a report on it soon. Um, so yeah, there are 32 uh, butterflies and skippers in the, in the lower 48. Um, uh, about two thirds of them have recovery plans. Uh, a minority of them have designated critical habitat and only a small minority have both recovery plans and a critical habitat. So th there's lots of work to be done um, to help these species. At, and at, as I'll outline a little bit later, um, the, the species that are most relevant to, to uh, Minnesota and the Midwest are the you know, Dakota Skipper, Apache Skipper, Lane Carner Blue, and Mitchell Sater. Um, wanted to briefly talk about the petition process and the, and the relevance for uh, bees and pollinators. Um, the petition process is indeed really important for getting protections for this group of wildlife. Um, petition process in general is pretty important. And the, the as in this graph, you can see that the about between 60 and 70% of all species that are protected under the act were started by a petition. So a group like the Xerxes Society or the center or individuals have told fish and wildlife, presented fish and wildlife with data about a species and they've acted upon that. Uh, plants are petitioned at a higher rate than animals. And as you can see, bees and butterflies as a subgroup are petitioned at a much higher rate than uh, other animal groups. Um, this could be for multiple reasons, um, but it, it shows that uh, the petition process is really important to get protections. Um, wanted to just highlight a couple examples to show um, which, yeah, the importance of, of the ESA listing and, and how these ESA species are doing. I wanted to start with Mitchell Sater. Uh, Mitchell Sater is uh, found in wetland habitats, uh, fens in um, Minnesota, or Michigan, uh, Indiana, Ohio, and some in New Jersey. Um, its larvae feed on uh, carex, the sedges. Um, it was first petitioned to be protected under the Act in 1974, um, although that petition did not present significant 
information at the time, but by the late 1980s, there, um, Fish and Wildlife became aware of massive amounts of collection. This species was highly collected, um, especially in New Jersey, um, which led to its emergency listing in 1991. However, it was too late for the populations in New Jersey, so this species is no longer found in New Jersey. Um, yes, final listing in 1992. Um, this species has a recovery plan, but no designated critical habitat. And unfortunately, um, since listing, this species has continued to decline with only 16 populations remaining in Michigan, one in Indiana. And according to the most recent five-year review, only six of those populations are considered viable. Um, so even though the species has been listed a while, there, there are barriers that um, we yeah. hope we can um, address more in the future. Um, another formerly widespread species in the Midwest, the Dakota skipper. Um, Dakota skipper had, um, yes, yeah, found in prairie fragments um, where its larvae feed on uh, native grasses. Um, the, yeah, the, the diminishing amount of native prairie has really driven the species down. Um, the species spent all, uh, its road to, to protection took 30 years. Um, so it, like, it, it, it can take long, a long time to get species protected. This one was a candidate, considered a candidate in 1984, uh, followed by two petitions, one from the center and then another from uh, the Xerxes Society in the early 2000s. Um, as well as multiple lawsuits before it was finally proposed to be listed in 2013. Um, so it, it shows that the, um, the, the efforts of multiple entities are re required to get these species listed. Um, it was finally listed in 2014. It has, and now it has a, a recovery plan as of last year and 20,000 acres of critical habitat. Unfortunately, it's, it's perhaps taken too long to list the species. The species status assessment shows that uh, about uh, the majority of all the remaining sites have less than 50% probability of persistence over the next 10 years. So there's much more work to be done and um, hopefully um, we can, but hopefully we can, it can recover. It, given enough time it has, uh, the protection under the act. I wanted to also highlight uh, an ESA success story, which is uh, Fender's Blue. This butterfly is found in the Willamette Valley of Western Oregon, where it's larvae feed on the endangered Kincaid's lupin. That took 20 years to get this species listed from the time it was a candidate in 1980 to final listing in 2000. Um, it, it has a recovery plan and designated critical habitat. This is a success story because um, through the cooperation of um, state and local uh, land managers and fish and wildlife personnel, as well as uh, intensive research, um, best management practices have been developed that have really um, shown to be really effective at uh, encouraging the growth of the host plant, as well as um, promoting the habitat for this species. So it's this species has uh, increased um, significantly overall in, in size and range. And so it's looking good for this species. Um, we don't have time to talk about all of the uh, ESA butterflies, but we also wanted to just give a, a little overview of the, of the rusty patched. Um, the rusty patched is the only bee listed in the lower 48 states. Um, as you can see on this slide, there's a lot, there's a lot of text. Um, and it really just highlights the fact that this was a controversial listing and it took the efforts of many organizations, many petitions, lawsuits, um, challenges um, to the Fish and Wildlife Service to get it protected. It started with um, a petition by the Zirkus Society in 2013. Um, but relative, but Compared to some butterflies, it, by uh, by 2017, it was listed. So it only, it only took four years between petition and listing. However, in those years, it took uh, two petitions and several challenges, legal challenges to Fish and Wildlife Service to 
uh, follow the letter of the ESA uh, to make a decision about it. The most recent lawsuits are uh, recently challenged the Fish and Wildlife Service's lack of designation for of critical habitat for the species. Um, so yeah, launched late last year, the NRDC and, and the center and others um, are hoping to win critical habitat for the species. That's uh, the species unfortunately continuing to decline. We, um, we'll see it decline a little bit farther likely uh, before it recovers, but um, the protection of the ESA is going to be really important. Um, and Tara is going to give you a couple of examples of the work that the center and others are doing to help um, protect the rest of Great. Thanks, Jess. Um, excellent. So uh, I mentioned earlier about the incidental take permits and consultation. And so the rusty patch bumblebee is now listed as an endangered species. And so whenever a federal agency is going to do some kind of action that could impact it, it needs to consult with Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, so if you look at this map on the left hand side, the gray area, the sort of shaded background gray, is the historic range of the rusty patch bumblebee. And the yellow dots um, have red dots inside them, and those are the areas the bee has been seen since 2007. And those are the areas that um, are sort of the high likely possibility that the bee would be there. And so if you are a federal agency um, going to do an action, those were the areas that you should hone in on. Um, so when protections do happen in those areas, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service has makes conservation guidances. So basically documents that say how to manage the area, how to do those mitigation measures. Um, unfortunately, in, in the recent past, I think the thinking on this is changing with publications. They've um, highly discounted non-native floral resources. And I know uh, non-native flowers and plants are, are, you know, controversial. But in the case of um, protection of the rusty patch bumblebee, a recent pu uh, publication came out showing that, you know, actually it, it does tend to use non-native flowers a bit for its energetic needs. And bumblebees really need um, thousands, I mean, hundreds of thousands of flowers per month. You know, they're just like little energy balls. They just need to like get lots of pollen and, and nectar to survive, as well as to fight off pesticides and pathogens like Jess mentioned with the American bumblebee. Um, and so discounting non-native floral resources um, and allowing them to be destroyed for projects can be very problematic for this highly endangered species. Um, so just to give you an example, um, a highway project was allowed in the Chicago, greater Chicago region. Um, and despite the bee being found there um, on and off over the years and the habitat being very floral rich, it just was that most of the floral, floral diversity was non-native. And so it was discounted and allowed to be impacted without um, mitigation measures. Um, in addition, that incidental take permit is often required. Um, however, at least during the Trump administration, and we're hoping that this sort of practice changes, the Fish and Wildlife Service didn't necessarily say you have to get an incidental take permit when you did activities. Um, for instance, in, in Minnesota, um, a, a, a mountain bike trail recently went through a park that is a, a good habitat for the rusty patch bumblebee where the bee has been found um, several years in a row and um, they did not have to get an incidental take permit and this is an example of sort of where we as the center kind of stepped in with some local partners and said well you know you should get an incidental take permit but if it's not going to happen then we should really focus on getting mitigation for the bee as a result of this trail and, and luckily we were successful in doing some of that. Um, so as just said, you know, unfortunately, so far, the service has not designated critical habitat for the rusty patch bumblebee. Um, but we really, you know, basically, this is just kind of going to show you that like once a species gets listed, that's sort of where the real work begins. And we need to really continue to harness knowledge about the rusty patch bumblebee as well as all pollinators, um, habitat management, you know, and really sort of assist the Fish and Wildlife Service, if you will, with new information and how we can protect this and other endangered species. All right.
Yeah, so that, so that being said, we just uh, wanted to wrap up the section on the ESA just by um, saying that the ESA works for pollinators. They're like, um, like Tara mentioned, the uh, yeah, consultation and um, take permits uh, protect the species um, from ongoing threats. Um, but what's also important is that um, the ESA engages uh, lots of local entities to, uh, yeah, and um, yeah, re and engages research in the species so we can figure out how best to best to manage the habitat so we can recover the species. Um, and yeah, the ESA works for mint for many different species. It, it works for uh, works for pollinators because it slows the decline of have. Uh, the decline of the species with habitat protection. Um, so that gives us the time that we need to develop these uh, practices so we can learn how to restore the species. Um, our research into the status of ESA listed butterflies shows that uh, half of ESA species are, are stable and some are increasing, um, which, which is encouraging. Um, some have not been listed uh, that terribly long. Um, and the ESA has sort of like this three, these three ingredients, the recovery plan, the critical habitat, and, and just time, and that is protected. And the longer these species have all three ingredients, the more likely they, they are to recover. Um, the ESA overall has, has protected more than 220,000 acres just because of the ESA listed butterflies. Um, I, you know, a lot of that is in California, but you know, the Dakota Skipper has 20,000 acres in, in North Dakota and South Dakota, um, and millions of acres are protected on behalf of other species, and these protected areas help pollinators. Great. Um, yeah, just a couple more slides. One is, you know, neonicotinoids obviously are uh, a big elephant in the room when it comes to the Endangered Species Act. They are, uh, you've heard in the last talk and you probably will several times over the next few days, um, how toxic they are to many animals, especially pollinators. Um, so one of the way we're trying to, to assist with that is um, with new policy. Uh, we have a couple bills um, in the works, uh, obviously Congress with Congress people, um, to try to ban neonicotinoids. One of them is the Saving America's Pollinators Act. Uh, this one is from 2019. Uh, unfortunately, that year, because of the politics, it died in committee. Uh, last year in 2020, there were other things going on, so it wasn't it wasn't reintroduced. However, uh, it's it's coming back. Um, we're reintroducing it, or the Congress people are reintroducing it this year. And, you know, we're really hoping to cancel registration of neonicotinoids um, and similar systemic pesticides. Also, the, this current version of the SAPA sets up a review for new pesticides, particularly to look at pollinator toxicity. And um, also, which is exciting to me, it also sets up uh, native bee monitoring. So hopefully it will pass in all its glory and uh, we'll actually move on from these really toxic pesticides, as well as to be able to protect endangered species. Okay. Yep. So um, here is, uh, if you guys are interested in um, sort of becoming an e-activist with us or a member or anything else, you can kind of go to biologicaldiversity.org backslash action. And currently uh, we have a couple actions related to what we're talking about. And actually I think probably more than that, <laughs> but you can check them out. Um, Specifically, um, Jess has one uh, about the American bumblebee to try to encourage the administration to list the American bumblebee as an endangered species. And he can talk more about that in a second, but I also just wanted to mention that there also is one about monarch butterfly. Um, the monarch butterfly decision to, uh, the basically was that, yes, it's warranted, that yes, it is declining and should have protection of the ESA, but it's precluded, which means that um, in, in sort of the speak of the service is that there are other sort of priorities and, and things that they need to take care of before they, they can list the, the monarch butterfly. Um, and so we, with this, the switch over the administration, we have sent a new action alert trying to encourage the new administration to actually go ahead and list the monarch because you know this year the numbers came out it's still not doing well especially the western populations of the monarch um yeah so you could help out help out and push push congress to do these to make these actions 
Well, the work at the Center for Biological Diversity really is to be applauded. You do so much on behalf of all the species in their habitat. Um,